Welcome back to Develop Lex. Uh, today, uh, I am stoked to welcome on Wes Murray. Um, Wes has been a friend of our, I guess you would call it our quote unquote sister podcast, Middle Tech. Um, have heard a ton about Wes um, over the last few years from Evan and Logan and just all the cool stuff that he's been involved in around Lexington and kind of all around the country. Um, so figured with as many notable projects as he's involved in, um, that would be awesome to talk to him about. So, um, I will let Wes introduce himself. Um, I'm, I'm saying Wes, correct? Yeah, yeah. it's Wes. I mean, <laughs> Wesley, but, uh, no, I only hear that when I'm in trouble. Okay. Yeah. I'm Weston. People call me Wes. People just assume sometimes. Um, so, uh, I will let Wes introduce himself. Um, so Wes, welcome on. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Um, so, uh, first question, how did you get to Lexington? Yeah, great question. Um, so originally from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is just a little northwest of Philadelphia, about an hour outside. And um, yeah, I made my way here, I think in 2010. Uh, it was right after uh, the GFC. Um, a classmate of mine in business school, uh, his name was Dale Leo, he, he was living here with, a, uh, with another classmate of mine, uh, Sonia, his wife. And he had uh, started a hedge fund. Um, at that time, it wasn't really big, but he was doing well. And it was a volatility strategy, pretty unique actually for the time. And um, I was in between opportunities and we started talking and um, I was actually living in Denver at the time. Um, and so came here a few times and uh, really liked Kentucky and uh, prefer working in person than remote. And uh, yeah, um, made the jump and um, found a house on McDowell and um, and he was right down the street and we went to, we went to work, uh, on building a hedge fund. Nice. That's awesome. Um, if there's ever a selling point on Lexington, it's the neighborhood probably that you live in now. Mm -hmm. was that, was that the first experience that you had with Lexington was kind of that area of Lexington? Yeah. I mean, so I got introduced, he lived on Fontaine yeah. and so I got immediately introduced to, uh, Chevy Chase and the walkability of it, the diversity of, you know, housing types, and, uh, you know, the mature landscaping and all that, right. It's just was, it's an awesome area. It's hard yeah. to beat and, uh, so easy to fall in love. And of course we worked on an office building on Euclid. Okay. So, I mean, literally like I was, I lived in a very, very tight circle. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it felt like home. Uh, Lexington is a very similar, um, size city to Lancaster where I grew up. Uh, our county of Lancaster is a little bigger. It's 550,000 people. Lexington is like 330, I think. And, um, but, uh, but it's, um, uh, rural agricultural, some manufacturing, you know, there's no tech companies per se of, of scale there or, or, or whatnot. But, uh, so it felt like home too. Yeah. That's awesome. So give us, can, can you kind of um, timestamp that? What what year roughly was that that you made your way to Lexington? About 2010. Okay. Wow, that's crazy. Because I know some notable projects you're involved in, and we'll get into those at some point um, throughout the interview. But today, so mm -hmm. that's 2010. You moved to Lexington in 2010. Today, if somebody asked you what you do, what would you say? Yeah, I get asked that a lot. And <laughs> I, I sometimes... Um, struggle because it's, uh, it's not like, uh, a one word answer, but I would say I'm a very opportunistic investor and entrepreneur. Right. And so I spent a lot of my time, um, identifying and thinking about, uh, opportunities that could potentially be companies. Um, and I spent a lot of time looking at certain investments I could make. Uh, or partner with people who are already in the process of building something. And uh, yeah, so the context switching throughout the day is pretty intense. Um, I can go from thinking about uh, something around food to thinking about real estate, to be thinking about manufacturing, uh, to thinking about something in the nonprofit sector, because we do a lot uh, philanthropically in Lexington as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of variety, which yeah. I mean, serves my ADD brain very well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's funny. So you mentioned real estate in there. Um, that sounds like a loaded answer on asking what you do. Um, 
how would you say, you know, obviously we're real estate and development related podcasts. How would you say you got involved in real estate in some capacity? Yeah. So I grew up in it. So my, uh, grandfather started a construction company, which is a very loose term, uh, with his dad, uh, in 1928, I think really they just had two tool belts, some hammers, um, and a compunction to build something. And, um, and so, uh, actually there's a really cool story. There's a, uh, there's a contract in my dad's office. My grandfather's passed away, uh, to build his first house. And it's the contract is on a single sheet of paper. Um, there are no architectural drawings because they weren't required at that time. And it lists out, you know, it's going to have a kitchen and it's going to have so many windows and so many bedrooms, no bathroom, obviously that would have been an outhouse in those days. And I think the price of the home was like, I don't know, it was under $2,000, right? Which is just amazing uh, that, that that document exists. Um, but anyway, my grandfather, um, he took that uh, company built with his dad and, and got heavy into residential construction. Um, and in the 40s and 50s um, and 60s, post-World War II, um, there was a huge housing boom. Um, and so he participated in that in, in Lancaster. Um, and back then development was totally different than it is today. Um, you would go, he would tell me these stories like, yeah, I'd go in, I'd buy a piece of ground. I'd go in and talk to a civil engineer who was also the township manager or the planning commission and the guy who stamped the drawing. And then we would, we would work it out over like a couple weeks, uh, draw some roads and some lots. Um, and it would get platted and then I'd say, okay, great. When are you guys going to put the water in the sewer (laughs) and the roads in, right? And so like, yeah, fast forward today, it's completely different. All that's, you know, now developer responsibility. But, um, so he just hit this perfect sweet spot in, in, you know, in the way that development was done in our country. And, uh, so anyway, my dad got involved obviously, and he took over that business and, Growing up, you know, um, I mean, my best friend was a digging iron, a shovel um, as, a, as a youth. But, you know, all the while I'm on job sites, I'm on looking at looking at plans, I'm doing takeoffs, I'm understanding costs. Um, so I understand construction at a pretty nuanced level. Um, I mean, I gr- graduated college in 2001 uh, with a computer science and economics year at Dickinson. It's a small school in, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And uh, 2001 was also the dot-com bubble burst. So I went from having lots of opportunities to zero. And um, my grandfather was like, don't worry, son, I got a job for you. And he handed me my trusty friend a digging iron. And, <laughs> and I was put on this uh, project he was working on laying uh, water and sewer pipe. Um, and it was deep, so we had to use a trench box um, to, you know, to avoid cave-ins. And, uh, the thing is, it's like, there's a big inefficiency if you get in and out of the trench box. So you're basically in there, um, for uh, the entire period from the start of day to lunch, they'll pull you out and then you'll get back in there after lunch. And he was like, this is going to be really good motivation for you to find a job. (laughs) (laughs) And he was a hundred percent right. I mean, I definitely packed on the college 15, maybe 30. Uh, but by the time August ran around, I had, I had lost it all inside that trench box. Uh, um, but yeah, so early on, just, so it was just around, it was a combination of like, uh, osmosis. It was a combination of like just exposure. Um, and every dinner table conversation, literally every dinner table conversation with my dad and my grandfather was centered around, um, construction development you know, what are we doing next? You know, all this sorts of stuff. So it was very, today it's, you know, it's second nature for me. I, it's just how I think. Yeah. And what, what do you feel like? Cause the shovel c- can't have been what drew you to real estate, no. but no. What, what do you feel like when you were sitting around those dinner tables or just being involved in those conversations, what do you feel like drew you, um, like you individually to real estate other than osmosis? Yeah. I mean, I really, um, enjoy, um, seeing something coming out of the ground that um, is super additive to the community. It's, it's got to feel natural. It's got to feel a part of it. Like, so the idea that, you know, um, I'm the type of guy, uh, by way of example, weirdly, like, you know, if the kitchen's messy, I'm going to go in and clean up the kitchen and make it look tidy and orderly, a little OCD there, right? 
and the, I view real estate and development the same way. Like, you know, how do you come in, take something that um, needs to be repositioned or has the opportunity to um, really just sort of transform an area and, and leverage, you know, whatever you're building or developing or renovating to do that. And so that's the transformative power when done well that real estate development can have in a community. And I'm really, really passionate about that and get super frustrated when I see individuals who don't take the level of care necessary in a community and end up putting shit online, as I mm -hmm. call it, um, or run out of money or really shouldn't be in the business at all. Um, because what happens in then is the, the you know, rightfully so in some respects, like the community mostly housed within planning commissions and ordinances and zonings push back and it ends up creating regulation to deal with the outlier versus, you know, the wider group is doing really great things, but we got to create all this regulation and control to deal with the outliers who maybe don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Or, or care. Yeah, absolutely. It's because, because of a few bad apples. That's right. It has made the industry a little bit more difficult yeah, to, the, to the, develop cool things. Well, and it's so much more costly now, you know, like to develop because, um, you know, you, the soft cost and the time on the front end to get approvals is just so much longer than it has. And it just keeps getting longer, which is net negative for housing, is net negative for affordability um, and, uh, and general, like just the growth of a city from a just as a cultural standpoint. DevelopLex is sponsored by SVN Stone Commercial Real Estate, a full-service commercial real estate firm located in Lexington, Kentucky, affiliated with the SVN International Network, which is comprised of over 1,600 advisors and staff and 200-plus offices across the globe. The SVN Stone team consists of experienced commercial real estate advisors in the heart of the bluegrass. SVN provides commercial real estate services to large corporations, middle market businesses, and individual entrepreneurial investors. Serving the greater Lexington area, SVN offers advisory services for sales, leasing, management, and development of commercial properties locally, regionally, and nationally. With transaction volume of over $400 million, the advisors at SVN Stone Commercial Real Estate have vast experience and deep understanding of all aspects of commercial real estate. Yeah, two, two things that stuck, stuck out to me there. One, I can tell that because you're rooted in Lexington, you care. Um, yeah. Because I think there, there are a couple of different ways to develop. There are people that just go into an outside area, build a run of the mill shopping center or whatever they've already built before mm -hmm. and just do it for profit. They don't really care what it looks like. So those can mess up your community a little bit. But then there's people that actually um, efficiently think through what a neighborhood needs. And it seems like um, that is what you care about. Um, so I think it would be helpful for the audience um, that's listening to understand maybe a little bit of the scale of some of the real estate ventures that you've worked on are. So if you could highlight a couple of the projects that you feel excited about over the last year, tenure in Lexington or around Kentucky, um, that would be awesome. So what are, what are a couple of the projects that you've been involved in? Yeah. I mean, uh, one, um, it, and it's not necessarily viewed as, uh, a real estate project, but it was, was, uh, you know, the renovation of the old Taylor distillery, you know, it was a 113 acre site. My partner, Will Arvin and I, um, when we bought that thing, we were we were definitely viewed as crazy. And when I first met Will, I thought he was crazy. Um, I just happened to join the club um, that he had started. So, um, but yeah, we went in there and, you know, it's akin to, I don't know, a war zone, um, environmental issues galore. And um, yeah, ended up turning it into, I think, um, one of the coolest places in Kentucky, very biased on that, obviously. But um, when you come around that corner and actually see a castle that doesn't feel corny, yeah. but actually is like a really, really cool castle, um, that's awesome. And I think the hallmark of a great place like that is it, it doesn't um, matter how much photography you get or how much video footage you get, et cetera. You really can't get the real experience until you're actually there. And that's like, like, I think that's like the hallmark of a really awesome spot. Yeah. But it took us four years and, um, I say four years, we'll, we'll still go and it's going to take probably 20 really to, to truly, truly bring it to its full evolution. Yeah. Um, so that was a fun, very fun, very cool, 
um, real estate project that had a bourbon distillery. For sure. To be super clear, you said 113 acres. Yeah. I consider that real. That I consider that a real estate project. Yeah. But it did, it did have about a million different facets to the project. I'm yeah. sure, other than real estate. Talk a little bit, if you could, um, about like what the initial vision was and how that came to fruition. Um, if you would. Yeah. I mean, the vision really evolved. I mean, um, Will found the property. Um, it had been on the market for years and actually the real estate agent who was showing it was kind of like reluctant to show it because he's like, bring a flashlight, you know, wear your boots, um, and br bring bug spray. And, and if you're allergic to poison ivy, probably don't want to go in these areas. And there's like asbestos signs everywhere. But, um, uh, but you know, he, he, he saw what I saw when I saw it, which is, wow, this is a place you can build a brand. There's nothing like it. And, um, you know, if we bring people there today, you know, I always say like, they're going to leave a fan of Castle and Key, even if they hate the product, it doesn't matter. They're buying the product because you know, you, you just brainwash them, um, on its own. But yeah, we walked in there and the, the vision was like, started small. Uh, we had a budget and, um, and that budget, uh, I knew was small, and I'm pretty sure Will knew it was small too, but he was much more uh, stuck to it in the early days. Um, and it quickly became clear that that budget was unrealistic. Um, and by the time we were done, we had spent a little over 10x that budget. Uh, so um, yeah, but it was a it was a very very cool experience to see it to see it come back. But the whole place, the whole idea was. It was originally built, Colonel Taylor built it as uh, the preeminent bourbon tourism destination. Back then, bourbon distilleries looked like refineries. You know, making fuel oil and stuff of that nature, sort of it's a it's the same chemistry process in a lot of ways as making bourbon. Um, and so we, um, and same, like literally the exact same thing for ethanol. Um, but uh, um, so they looked like refineries. So you didn't really want to visit it. They were dirty, loud, smelly, and not safe. And he built the first, this is Colonel Taylor, built the first distillery that was catered towards serving tourists. And he literally had a railroad going through it and would bring, you know, custom coaches in the, the, the private plane uh, version of that day, right? Um, and you would come in and have garden parties and all kinds of stuff there. So, I mean, to have a garden at a distillery um, was so ahead of its time yeah. uh, that, um, you know, and that, so that's what we saw and bringing that back, um, was really important to both of us. Absolutely. So to what I'm hearing is taking a place that had maybe had, um, better days and making it better. Yeah. You're ta taking an old piece of property or an old idea and making it better, which is kind of real estate development in mm -hmm. general, especially in a market like Lexington, that's yeah. all infill. For the most part at this point um what is i mean that's that's amazing what is another uh project i know uh there's one that you're probably pretty passionate about that has just recently opened um can you tell us a little bit about the manchester and what that process has looked like yeah i got introduced to nick feldman um in 2021 um maybe it was 2020 uh, well anyway one of those two years and uh, by a friend of mine, and he was like, you need to meet this young kid. Um, he's not that young, but he's, now that I'm 46, he's younger than me. <laughs> and um, he starts talking to me about this site he had secured and his vision to build this high-end hotel. And for me, I immediately latched onto this because it's a pretty easy decision. I mean, when people come to town, and we would host a lot of people, especially during the Castle and Key days. Um, and it would be, they were like, okay, where do I stay? Well, you know, um, you know, there's a 21C, but it's an acquired taste. It's a great hotel, but it's artsy. Um, and then you've got the, the Hyatt, which is a little tired. You've got the Hilton, which is not as tired. And, and then later became, you know, the Marriott and the Residence Inn. And, but there was no, like, really high. If someone was wanting to spend three, four or five hundred dollars a night, there was no option that was worth that rate. Right. And so for me, like having experienced that for multiple years, I knew there was a hole in the market. So while I think some people saw that as a risk to build that hotel, I saw it as a no brainer. And it was just like, wait a minute, can the kid do it? Um, and I say, kid, um, we talk all the Nick and I talk all the time. Um, and, um, what's it going to look like, who's going to run it and all these sorts of things. And, 
Yeah, I said, and he was very nervous. Like he was like, can I raise the capital to do this? How do I find the right banking partners? And um, myself and um, a good friend of mine, Brett Setzer, we, we got behind it. Um, and then we also brought in some, some other, other, other individuals in town and yeah, um, we got the money raised, I think a little bit faster than he ever thought. Um, and I own a pretty big chunk of it and very proud of it. And I'm very proud of Nick. Um, I think what he's done there and, and what he's, what he has coming down the pike is really amazing. And he's going to do some really amazing things for Lexington and we're very lucky to have him. Yeah. What are... I love the Manchester. It was actually Evan and Logan were the first people to bring me to it. Um, there's nothing like a, uh, I guess it was the fall when I first went out there. Um, a fall day in Lexington mm -hmm. ended on the rooftop and oh, yeah. at the Manchester. That's a pretty neat thing, especially to look at that area and see like the revitalization of Manchester Street. Obviously, I wasn't alive when Manchester Street was just pure industrial yep. or at least wasn't a cognizant of that. Um, but to see like a bustling walkable area in the Manchester, um, that's pretty neat. What are some of the attributes that you feel like kind of set the Manchester apart, um, from some of the other product in town? Well, I mean, or maybe um, even that area, like, why do you get excited about a place like Manchester street? Yeah. I don't know if it's necessarily the street, um, per se, although I, I, I believe that that whole area right next to town branch park is just going to take off. Um, and I'm on the, uh, board of town branch park and, you know, have a, had, had a lot of confidence in 21 that it was going to come to fruition when other people didn't. In fact, I was one of the first people to, to donate money to the park because I was like, this is a no fucking brainer as I yeah. put it to Ann uh, Bacus, um, and, um, and continue to support it in any way that I can. Um, so yeah, that, that to me was like, you know, you're just tying on. Right. Um, and all of Manchester street, by the way, is going to be redeveloped in the next 10 to 15 years, like from, from Oliver Lewis way to the railroad bridge. Right. That's all going to be probably vertical product a combination of hotel, apartments, et cetera, uh, which is awesome. Yeah. Right. Incredible. And it's coming like, you know, it's just, it's, it's just going to happen. Um, but you know, inside the, when you get to the, inside the hotel, it just felt like you were in a larger urban market. Yeah. Right. And we brought a lot of those, and I, sh I shouldn't say I, Nick and, his, and, uh, Hank, who is his, his partner, design partner on the, on the property. They did an amazing job of like, just making it feel like you walked inside of like a hotel in New York city. Right. And the rooftop bar is so cool. And then the, the chef that they brought Paula is phenomenal. Like the food there, I don't think people really appreciate just how good the food is at that restaurant. Um, it is, you know, we're very lucky to have her here and her team that she's building to, to really, you know, curate such a, just such an amazing, another amazing option yeah. for food. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, and it, again, it's taking something that was because what was the Manchester before? It was a cold storage building. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, like, so it's like some white. I don't know if you go, if you look at old pictures, like there's like a white, like I think it was like a white cold storage building of some type. Yeah, you know, and they did just an amazing job. Great vision. I think that is one of the attributes that is most exciting about that project. Is it obviously there was some momentum in the area, right? But it wasn't like a no brainer. Like it wasn't like you bought the last parcel on the block mm -mm. that was already developed. It's like there had, there was some like risk for sure. Well, like we were building during COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. like, I mean, that was the part, like, what are you guys doing building a hotel? No one's going, no one's traveling. I'm like, yeah, I'm making the bet that people are going to want to travel a lot, <laughs> a lot post COVID. And it was funny that the weekend that we opened, there was a big push open for like the first weekend of Keeneland in April. And I said, guys, it's better to open a little late and, and not worry about Keeneland. And anyway, for, it was right around, uh, UK's graduation and I don't know, it was some event was happening anyway. Like we, the UK was parking people like in Cincinnati because they had all these like events happening on campus. Yeah. And so the, the first night's uh, room rates were like $700 the really? first weekend we opened. It was crazy. Yeah, like, uh, I think this is going to work. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, but it's, it's not coming with us with its trials, man. Uh, I give Nick and his team a lot of credit. 
it's it's not easy and uh, building a hotel is not the same as operating a hotel and, and they operate it. Um, it's unflagged presently, um, which presents challenges too because you, you have to make up for the fact that you're not pulling in the midweek business traveler who wants to travel for points, right? Yeah. That's the advantage of the Marriott and Hilton brands. Um, but uh, on the weekends, um, you know, we're the rate setter. Yeah. Absolutely. I would a hundred percent agree with that. I'm a huge Hilton guy too. So yeah. but if I'm going to that, the thing is, if I'm going to a new market, like if I wasn't from Lexington and I was visiting Lexington, I am, I am very much somebody, me and my wife are people that very much look for products similar to the Manchester to be able to experience a city um, that's not from somewhere like a Hilton. It's like, I want to go to the coolest place in town. That's right. where I want to stay. If I'm going to spend 48 hours in Lexington. Like I want to go to the place that's really neat. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Okay. So now that I guess uh, people have a decent feel for some of the projects you've been involved in and a little bit of your taste in real estate, what are some of the biggest learnings along the way, um, that you've had as a real estate investor, developer, et cetera? Yeah. Um, well, I think, a a big one, and it's been more of sort of observing how I've been successful um, is partnering with, first of all, partnering with really sharp individuals, like just they're, they're a rung above. Yeah. Right. That's, that's an important characteristic. They, they know their, uh, they know their specialty uh, of work better than everybody else. Um, um, I'm a, Brett Setzer is one of my uh, dear friends in town and he, He's friend like of the program, Brett friend, friend of the program. And he, you know, he, I don't know if anybody really knows industrial, um, you know, transportation based facilities, which he has in built, uh, across the country, uh, in our market anyway, better than Brett. And so, you know, when, you know, if I want to make an allocation into that market, I mean, it's going to be with Brett, like that's easy. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason the, the hotel is successful is because of, because of Nick be the reason the castle and key was successful is because the team that we built around that we, we, um, we also own a machining business in town uh, in Nicholasville, actually, uh, Brett and I do. And, uh, the reason that that is successful is because the founder is like a savant when it comes to the art of making really complex parts. And so they're doing stuff for rockets and airplanes. And I mean, you see these guys make these parts and you're like, holy crap. I don't know anything about how to make these parts. I understand how to guide and to help a business grow, um, you know, but, uh, you know, again, uh, partnering with those individuals who are just exceptionally good at their craft is critical, I think, to be successful. And to me, if, if, if for me to be continue to be successful, I think it's less about me actually doing the work and me identifying individuals who I think are really just exceptional and partnering with them to help them grow. I think that that's an amazing, I love, I love thought of partnerships. I almost kind of was seeking you to speak into that a little bit when you were talking through the three things I know, or the thing I noticed when you were just talking about those projects that you've invested in is you have mentioned on every one, another individual mm -hmm. that had a vision that you wanted to come alongside of, or just, come alongside another developer or investor. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, with that said, when you're going into those partnerships, are you wanting to absorb the information um, that maybe somebody else has and work alongside? Or are you a person that wants to do what you're good at and wants to let somebody else do what they're good at and call that a partnership? Um, yeah, I want to be value add. I mean, I, I don't, I rarely am involved in something just, just for the purpose of investing money. That to me is is not. Um, that's not. That's the stock market. Yeah. Right. And so that's not. That's not interesting. Um, I want to be able to make an impact, be a value, um, et cetera. And you know, I don't. I don't charge for it. Right. Yeah. You know. I mean, my my currency uh, that I give is is, is time and. Um, and advice and guidance and I, and I love to learn. So every time, um, I never invested in a hotel before the Manchester, right? That was a, so I understood real estate. I understood how they worked, having <laughs> paid for a number of hotel bills in my life. Um, uh, but I hadn't, I didn't know shit about it. Right. Um, I know a lot more now, not near as much as Nick and his team, but, um, 
you know, now, now much wiser, right. Uh, about it. And it's, it's, uh, that opportunity to learn, make money is kind of a pretty damn cool thing. Right. Um, and so I hope I get to do that the rest of my life, you know? And, uh, yeah, so, um, it's, yeah, the, the money's nice. Um, not doing it for that anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm doing it for, for fun. Um, it's a game, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a damn fun one. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, with that said, yeah, I guess that's a, that's a really neat attribute, um, that you have in partnerships. What are some of the actual attributes that you look for in a partner outside of just having value? Are there, are there attributes that when you have your first meeting with Nick Feldman, you're like, I want to invest in this guy. I want to invest with this guy. Yeah. I mean, they got to be smart. Yeah. Right. Um, in some capacity that's relevant to the success of the project. Right. Um, whatever that is or business or whatever it may be. If they, if they don't, if they don't have an edge there, um, uh, I mean, it, it becomes really, really challenging. Um, and they have to have a certain amount of, um, uh, just gusto for lack of a better term. Like they got to want it. It's not easy. Right. Uh, whether it's a real estate project or a business or whatever, success is by no means guaranteed. Um, and uh, uh, it, there's going to be problems. And when there are problems, one of the, one of my favorite lines to say is, guys, this is to be expected. We are right where we're supposed to be. Because mm. um, if you're not experiencing problems in whatever you're doing, I promise you, you're just not you're, you're missing it. Um, problems are part of business. Um, and so those those are big things they have to be able to sell right? They have to be able to sell to some capacity what they're doing. If you can't sit in a room and sell somebody on your vision of whatever that vision is, you're, you, you're going to have a really, really hard time uh, being successful at the top of the pyramid running something. I don't care if it's an apartment building, uh, if it's a retail store, it doesn't really matter. You got to be able to sell at some level too. So yeah, those are, those are the, 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 the big things for me. Um, I've learned that I like to have a little more individuals have a little more experience now. Um, but, um, not afraid to also take a chance on someone who I think is just really sharp. Um, I've, I've done it a lot and I've got the, got the wins and losses to show for it. <laughs> Craftsman Contractors is Central Kentucky's one-stop shop for roofing, windows, siding, and gutters. Craftsmancontractors.com slash contact us will get you straight to the form you need so that their team will get in touch about your project. Or just text Stephen at 859-246-0108. When they finish your project of windows, siding, gutters, or roofing, you'll see what they mean when they say we build with integrity. So, okay, so relaying that into kind of current day. Um, one, I do want to touch on Hunsicker yep. because even though that's not necessarily real estate related, yep. um, I do think it's a really neat thing that we had on our intro call. Um, but today, um, at, as it relates to real estate and development, living in Lexington, what do you feel most excited about or what are some projects that you feel excited about in your personal life and your personal business today? Yeah, I think um, Lexington's at a is a it's just an interesting market. I, I I'm um, so I've got good visibility across the country um, for different product types. Um, I know uh, it feels like Lexington's expensive at times. I would say it's still relatively cheap um, um, in terms of like when you think about about per square foot all in cost. It's far cheaper to build here than it is in other markets. Part of that is the fact is we're a secondary tertiary city. Um, part of that is um, we just can't, and we're, we're lucky to be that be that way. I'm not sure it always feels that way in housing though right now. We're building, my wife and I are trying to build a house and it's it's ungodly expensive. <laughs> um, we're, gonna build, we're gonna do it though, because it's not gonna get any cheaper. Um, but, you know, um, Thesis wise, I feel like whether it's here or other markets, like multifamily is going to make a resurgence. Um, uh, construction costs aren't going down because labor costs aren't going down. I think there'll be some material costs um, that come off a little bit, but you know, um, inflation's here to stay, and it's here to stay for the long term. As as are higher interest rates. Um, this doesn't bode well for 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 housing costs, and so the hack to lower housing costs is you have to have. Um, you know, you've, you've got to have shared, uh, shared resources, shared walls, shared foundations, shared, 
shared underground utilities. You know, you, you have to find ways where you're getting um, more, more on less, right? And the only way you can do that is to be vertical um, and to also um, have multiple units in the same building. So in theory, you could do condos. Um, I don't see Lexington as being a huge condo market. I think there's appetite for some, and there's a nice project happening downtown that I, uh, I'm really excited to see come to fruition. But ultimately, I think it's going to be uh, apartments, and I think it's going to be that way here and in most urban markets. And so, yeah, I'm highly focused there. Our first, our first focus is to actually acquire um, a property, residential property management businesses. And so we're active in that space today, um, not in Lexington per se or in Kentucky, but in, in larger geographies, um, larger urban markets. Um, and then hopefully to expand that out. And then having, having that um, capability allows you to acquire uh, multifamily assets. Self-managing is, is by far the best way to do it. Um, but you can also self-manage cheaper if you've got a third-party business where you can offset a lot of your overhead and operating costs. Um, and, you know, we're thinking, you know, scale. So on the property management side, you know, you know, five years from now, I would love to have north of 50,000 units under management. Um, you know, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, in the meantime, we'll, we'll, we'll start and, and bite, bite an apple in the, in the several thousand area and, and, and go from there. But yeah, that's that's what I'm most excited about in the near term. I think there's some uh, opportunity in the uh, select service hotel space. So uh, another pro project that Nick spearheaded was the Everhome that's on Citation in Newtown where the Kroger's going. I think that's going to be a, a slam dunk uh, sort of product. And I suspect that that product could be what well, is being expanded across the country. And there's a lot of activity in that particular category. Uh, so that that too is interesting, and then the third the third space, which is sort of obvious across the board, is just um, affordable housing. Um, uh, I know Holly Wiedemann, or yeah, Holly's been on the uh, podcast, right? And she's she, I mean, no one knows that space better than her in our world. We're lucky to have her in Lexington too. But there's such a need for that, um, and really because of construction costs, a lot of the big, really big developers out there. Developers who are, say, putting north of $100 million up to a $1 billion a year in new start apartment development across the country have basically stopped most of their ground-up development and are focused now more on purchasing value-add product with a pretty simple rubric, right? They want to own stuff that's um, 2000 or newer vintage. They want it to be plus or minus 30% under replacement cost, and they want it to pencil at the high teens to 20% IRR. If you can hit those three uh, metrics, um, then there's a fairly substantial appetite for product, and a lot of that appetite's happening in NOAA, naturally affordable, uh, naturally occurring affordable housing product, um, and um, in uh, using four percent LIHTC uh, uh, capital stack. And while Kentucky is one of those markets where all of our LIHTC dollars from the HUD, because we're such a small state, get you know utilized like that. Uh, markets like Florida and Texas and even in California, um, well, affordable rents in those markets are vastly different than affordable <laughs> rents here. Like like uh, affordable in, in Florida can be up sometimes upwards of $2,000 a month, which is insane to me, but they're not using their LIHTC pools uh, completely. And so there's a lot of appetite in those markets to buy, buy older vintage products, 20 plus years old, right? Uh, repurpose it and then you know use those LIHTC dollars and their and their capital relationships to have a pretty attractive pro, uh, return profile uh, for for investors. But um, so all in all, though the multifamily sector is a little bit of shakeout over the next three years because there's such a build up. But uh, love love the space on the long arc of the next ten to fifteen. Yeah. And it seems like what I'm hearing from that too is you're opportunistic within that sector. You're not going and trying to buy a four cap new build uh, project no. in California. You're yeah, you're crazy. trying to figure out different ways to make money or different ways to add value in different sectors of multifamily. Well, California, especially like there's certain markets in California <laughs> yeah, where like uh, uh, like uh, so LA's got the mansion tax now, which is a five and a half percent transfer tax. That's applied to anything over five million dollars. So if you look at actual deal volume since that was passed, it it looks like a cliff, 
right? No, there's just no transactions occurring of any substantial size because if, if you got a hundred million dollar property um, that's going to sell and you got to pay five million dollars in transfer tax, especially if you're like a merchant builder or if you're a, a ground up developer who's doing a fast lease up with the idea of they're going to flip it into a REIT or something like that, your, your promote's gone. Yeah. Right. So you have zero incentive to actually build on your product. So they, I'm not sure that's fully baked in up over there yet, but, uh, uh, they'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as we start to wind down, I do, uh, even though it's not necessarily real estate related, um, one, I think, uh, an aspect of you is that you're involved in so many different things. So we could, to be very clear, we could talk about real estate for probably 10 hours on this podcast absolutely. with you. We could also talk about all the other ventures that you're involved in um, for another 50 hours. Um, so uh, there are a lot of things that we're missing, but I do want to touch on Hunsicker quickly yeah. and let you talk about that venture um, for just a minute, if you'd be willing, just because I think that a lot of people in this space, in the investing space, will just get a lot of value out of that. Yeah, so Hunsicker... Um, is a uh, entity that um, its purpose is to build companies, right? From the ground up or through partnering with companies that are a certain stage and are kind of locked out, whether it be from capital or they just don't know they have the opportunity, et cetera, just sort of outside perspective and help them grow into, their, to, into a bigger vision of what they could be. Um, so my partner in that is Becca Self, uh, who formerly ran and started and ran Food Chain and um, Nourish Lexington, which was an endeavor that was started during the pandemic. Um, and I met her through um, you know, our philanthropic activity and was just super impressed, just really smart. Um, I always kid her, she's one of the three, three most smartest people I know in, in, in Kentucky. And she says, I wanna know who the other two people are. Uh, and I said, the beauty, of, beauty of being in the top three, <laughs> just be happy. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, just really, I uh, was always impressed. And in 21, um, I, I, I was over at uh, her at Food Chain and, and, and the vision was Aquaponics Farm, which she has there. Uh, uh, learning kitchen, teaching kitchen, and then uh, a bodega was the the last piece. And I looked at her, and said, "Becca, when are you when are you going to build this damn bodega, this this grocery store, uh, for 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 your constituents here?" And she's like, "So it turns out I'm rolling out a food chain. I've done my thing here, and I'm going to pass the baton to the to the next group." And I said, "Great, let's talk." <laughs> um, and then spent the better part of a year, year and a half, you know, sort of formulating what it would be like to partner together to to um, think about building purpose-driven companies, right? The idea is, is that like, you know, we do a lot, we do do a lot of work in the philanthropic space and some work needs to stay there. You know, I, it's a, if you're dealing with children or moms or drug abuse or, or, or just abuse in general, um, you know, that's, there's no, there's, there never really should be a profit motivation around that, right? But there's other things like housing, food, um, education, um, which sometimes gets re relegated to nonprofit sectors that maybe shouldn't be there because the incentives aren't right. And there's a big conflation, like in, in the word nonprofit sometimes gets confused with no profit, um, where nonprofit just really means if whatever money you have left over, you know, that's in excess of your operating costs, just gets automatically reinvested into your cause at some level. Most nonprofits don't think that way. Most nonprofits just think that they then they have to constantly um, raise money. There's no sustainability model to that. So, uh, and Beck and I had that sort of shared purpose that, hey, we have to pull some of these issues out of the nonprofit sector, build businesses around them so that they have true sustainability. Um, and that's the purpose of Hunsicker. And so we, we focus in a couple of core areas. One is food and food access. So we have, um, we're actually presently piloting a school lunch um, solution right now, um, which is really, really fascinating. Um, somewhat hamstrung um, in states like Kentucky because we don't have a charter school system here, which is about to change, it sounds like. But in other markets where charter schools have taken off, um, you know, a lot of times the, the food is not provided by the school. And then, of course, um, where it has worked in those charter schools, the school districts would follow it on. And so they have much healthier options for food, much higher participation rates, et cetera. So it's really, really fascinating. 
Um, and so we also work in affordable housing, which directly, that's where my worlds get to blend a little bit, right? So I get to focus on, you know, one of the, the things that I'm really interested in in the property management space um, is to build out a really compelling affordable housing property management arm to that. Uh, because it's if property management is a highly fragmented industry in general, affordable housing is 10x fragmentation, right? Um, because the people who typically have property management arms for affordable are the developers, because there's a lot of compliance issues around the tax credits that are used and they want to avoid clawback issues, et cetera, because there's a lot of liability there. But eventually something needs to trade hands and it does, and there's just a lot of... Um, a lot of opportunity in that space. Uh, and then the, the the third pillar we're highly focused on is, you know, it's kind of a twin like uh, labor and education, right? There's, I think, a big reckoning over the 10 to 15 year period as well happening in the whole higher education space. It's very expensive. Um, I think a lot of the small schools that, um, that exist across the country are going to go out of business because if you look at the size of the second grade class to the size of the 12th grade class today, there's a pretty big difference in size, right? So we just have less kids gonna be moving through the system. The value proposition of education isn't what it once was. Most everything that's taught um, at UK, you can get online for free in any language from just about 100 to 1,000 different sources and all you need is a computer and an internet connection. Um, so the really the value that, that universities and colleges provide is that I've got a piece of paper that says I graduated. And the only reason that piece of paper is required is because employers want it. If employers didn't require that and instead were willing to take, take certificates or, or SAT scores or ACT scores, I think people would not go to college at near the same level as they do today because it's just used as a gateway. Employers use the college education model as a filtering criteria, yeah. right? It is nothing more than a filtering criteria. And once, like I remember graduating from uh, MBA program at Vanderbilt and being so worried about my GPA and the majors and the classes and all this sorts of shit. And then, you know, and it matters maybe for a millisecond during the interview, the very next job after that, nobody gives a shit. Yeah. What have you done, yeah. right? No one cares about your, once you reach like, 28 years old, where'd you go to school? Yeah, okay, great. What did you do there? Then there's no question. There's no question about what courses you took, what did you learn, et cetera, because no one really cares, right? What they care is that you went. Um, and to me, I think employers to meet their, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going way off on a tangent here. That's what I asked um, for, I'm here. Yeah, so employ employers to meet the labor demands that they have are already starting to drop um, uh, de with the degree requirements, it's called degree inflation in, in, uh, in the HR world. I think it's going to happen even more than people realize. And so, yeah, okay. You, you want someone who's great at accounting. You only have a four year accounting degree. Maybe you need like a 18 month accounting certificate, right? Um, uh, you want someone who's strong in, um, I don't know, engineer. So if you're going to be an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, something like that, that probably makes sense. But do you really need to go to four years of undergraduate school before you go to medical school? I don't know. Maybe or you can. Do I need to go to four years of business school before I go into business? No. Like what is the point? Yeah, I mean, I look at my MBA curriculum, um, and I know you can do it in a year, right? I know you can probably do it part time, right? But there's just this um, um, stigma, positive stigma in a way, right. That's like, Ooh, you went to a full-time MBA program that was in the top 25. No one gives a shit. Right. Now 46, I, I mean, I don't have a resume, you know? Um, and so I don't know. I think for me, uh, I think universities and, um, will have to really grapple with this because the next generation of parents who are dealing with this really high student debt and having to pay it off independent of whether the federal government does anything about that. Um, I mean like, yeah, maybe my son doesn't need to go to a four year degree. Right. I mean, you can be, you can come out of for our machining company, for example, we can hire somebody in and within three to four years, they can be making high thirties, low forties per hour, you know, probably working even some overtime. And, um, yeah, that's a great living. Right. And you, it's really hard to graduate from a four-year degree, making you now you're however many uh, uh, tens of thousands of dollars in debt, and you're making forty-five thousand dollars a year. Who's winning, right? 
in that model. And to me, it's the guy who, or girl who said, Hey, you know what? I want to go be a welder, a plumber, a, a whatever. And, 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 and build a real skill or trade that's probably actually needed the university in this country as well. Huh? I said, and probably the university is also a winner in that case. Absolutely. Yeah. Getting paid to do that. That's right. So yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm personally, um, so those are the spaces we work in. Right. And so we're always trying to figure out the right entry points um, to be able to grab a significant enough foothold um, where we can begin to, you know, sh- uh, pilot, test, build small monopolies, et cetera, to then expand and, and grow. So we're, we're in the business, I say, Huntsicker's in the business of two things. One, identifying opportunities, and two, identifying really awesome founders. Yeah. If we do those two things really well, we'll be successful. That's amazing. Two pretty broad, broad categories, which gives you more room for success, I'd say. Correct. It's awesome. Um, okay. Forward-facing questions related to Lexington. Um, what are you most excited for in the city of Lexington right now? That can be a wide array of things. That can even be a new coach. I don't know. But it, <laughs> yeah. can, it, can, be, it can be whatever you want to be. Yeah, well, we're going to get at least uh, yeah, new basketball coach on the way, <laughs> yeah. I suppose. Um, um, but... Um, I, I think the the there's a lot of positive happening in this city behind the scenes that I don't think gets talked about a lot. Um, and everything from, you know, performing arts to children's museums to new facilities and just uh, I think there's gonna be a, a resurgence of the downtown um, is what I what I'm seeing. And that's that's really exciting. Um, I think the, um, the, the Rupp Arena, 18 acres, I think it's a tough project right now. Uh, it's, a, it's a heavy capital lift requiring a lot of debt. And I'd say that, you know, best case scenario, maybe a shovel gets put on the ground in 26, 27, but it's going to require a meaningful change in capital markets for something to happen there. Um, but um, all in all, like the downtown Lexington market is, um, it's going to get better. Um, and it's, uh, and it's going to get more dense with more activity, more housing, um, and, uh, more amenity. And to me, I mean, I live, I live close to that area. That's exciting. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, got the soccer facility that, um, you know, Mr. Shab was putting in, uh, out there on Richmond road, which is just phenomenal. I don't think anybody really appreciates how amazing that is that someone's willing to make that investment in this community. Um, yeah, I mean, Lexington's growing. Whether you want it to grow or not, yeah. it's growing. Um, and uh, it's going to push and prod and pull wherever it needs to to grow. And so that leads me to my next question. Maybe the end of your answer leads me to my next question. What do you feel like? This will be our parting question. What do you feel like Lexington and the people of Lexington can do can do to continue to change for the better? It's a loaded question. I know. Yeah, that's a, that is a loaded question. <laughs> Um, change for the better. You mean from a real estate perspective or just whatever perspective you want? Real estate's real estate's fine. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Kentucky has tremendous untapped opportunity. Um, and I would say it needs to lean in more into what it's already great at, um, and support those industries, those, um, which would be like agriculture, manufacturing, transportation, you know, stuff of that nature. This is where we're really good Mm. and we have some really strong expertise and we need to be supporting these industries at every possible turn. Um, and I think, you know, we need to do some really smart, um, things within our government. And I think the Individuals need to become much more involved. The citizens of Lexington need to become much more involved in what's happening in their government. Uh, there's a great organization called Civic Lex that's uh, uh, run by Richard Young. And we, we are a big supporter of those uh, of him and that organization because they're, they're, you know, you can read the Herald Leader all you want and it's, a, it's nice to have a local newspaper. But if you want to know what's happening in our government, um, talk to Richard, go visit his website, get on his newsletter that's what's happening. And when you get, when you, when you see what's happening, like I, I wish more people would get involved in, in that versus getting, you know, up in arms about one particular project, hmm. right. That may or may not have really that much of a draconian effect on their neighborhood as they may think it would. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm, um, 
I, I think getting involved in really knowing what's going on in government is is one of the most important things. A lot more policy and impact to your daily life happens at your local government level than it does at the federal government level. Federal government is an allocator of capital mm -hmm. for a state like Kentucky, right? Uh, your local government, they're the ones who are making their minds up whether you're getting a grocery store here or you're getting it over there, yeah. right? Um, because, and they can make that process as complicated as possible. They're the ones who decide whether you get a three foot sidewalk or a five foot sidewalk. Um, and that may not seem like a big deal, but when your kids are riding their bicycle on it, it is, mm. you know? And so I think that sometimes gets missed and, you know, getting more involved in what's going on with your, with your, uh, local government and, and asking the tougher questions, um, of the people who help us run this local government. I think is really, really important. And we need a vision for Lexington coming from the top. We presently do not have a vision in my opinion. Um, and that's a real disappointment. And I'm hoping that that comes to fruition soon, but we presently have no vision for what's gonna happen. The vision is happening on a private level at the moment. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to that, but it can run off the rails too, mm. so. That's awesome. That was a great, that was a fantastic answer. Um, Wes, we are super lucky to have you in Lexington. Somebody who's a visionary for the city and outside of the city as well. So thank you for coming on DevelopLex. Yeah, thanks for having me.